tomorrow, the second episode of BBC Two's new series Now the War is Over looks back to the time when the meagre wartime diet began to be supplemented by a few welcome imports from abroad. U-boat attacks on the Atlantic convoys had cut supplies of food and raw materials. And the war effort had taken up most of what could be produced at home. Food, clothes and fuel were rationed. With the war over, the first supplies from abroad reached Britain. An extremely important arrival was, of course, the good ship Tilapa, coming into Avonmouth from the West Indies with a cargo of about 10 million bananas. I do remember giving one to my younger son, who was then age seven. I gave him a banana and he said, what on earth is this? And this shows you what six years without a banana has done to this young man. He's forgotten how to tackle the darn thing. Now the war is over, invokes memories of making do tomorrow at 9.30. Well, tonight we come to the last of the series in which Alec Clifton Taylor visits, examines and enjoys his favourite English towns. This beautiful spot isn't, I think, as well known as it deserves to be. It's the Kipia Quarry, in the woods above one of our loveliest rivers, the Weir in County Durham. Now, the wonder of this place is that it was from here that came much of the stone for one of the most glorious buildings in England. This quarry hasn't been worked for centuries, but one can't look at it, surely, without feelings of the most profound reverence. What did these stonemasons give us? Well, I don't want to be accused of exaggeration, so let me just say the finest Romanesque building in the world. A great many people's acquaintance with Durham Cathedral doesn't extend beyond the view from the train on the way from King's Cross to Scotland. But that's already sensational enough. The cathedral is built on a precipitous rock in a loop of the River Weir. Not surprisingly, this is where the Norman bishops erected on a high artificial mott or mound their keep. And it's on this rock-girt peninsula that most of the appeal of the city of Durham resides. And that's where this program will be centred. Without the concentration on the rock, the rest of the town might never have existed. If much of the remaining architecture of Durham is modest, some houses can claim to have about the most dramatic view in England. To step for the first time into Durham Cathedral must always be, for anyone in love with architecture, one of life's most thrilling experiences. Of all our Norman cathedrals, this is far and away the best proportion. 
elsewhere, the arcade tended in the 12th century to be rather low in relation to what it carried. But here it isn't. It's two and a half times the height of the Tribune, the gallery above the aisle. The piers are of two kinds, circular and composite, employed alternately. The circular piers have geometrical ornamentation, chevrons, spirals, vertical flutes, and diapers, incised with unforgettable vigour. The major part of the cathedral was completed in 1133, but some 40 years later, a remarkable addition was made. The west end was enclosed by a lady chapel known as the Galilee Chapel. Here, massiveness gives place to elegance. The piers are slender, and there are five aisles, so the cross vistas are complex and fascinating. No other cathedral has a chapel anything like this one. And at the other, the eastern end, the cathedral breaks into the most exuberant Gothic. In 1242, to serve the purpose of the monks, the Norman apse began to be replaced by the Chapel of the Nine Altars. The shafts of the wall arcade are of the local frostily marble, a limestone so full of fossils that, like Purbeck, it will take a polish. This formed a soaring addition to the building, where the stress is all on the verticals. The Neville screen, inserted in 1380, is a delight, surely the best Gothic weredas of any. This isn't of the local sandstone. It's made of corn stone from Normandy and was carved in London and shipped up in pieces all ready to be assembled. It was once filled with alabaster figures, which have all vanished. I wonder how much this matters. The many openings are delightful. And most remarkable of all, this building, unlike any other English cathedral of the period, was vaulted from the outset. The transept vaults, dating from about 1110, and that over the nave, finished in 1133, have stood unscathed for more than eight and a half centuries. How was this accomplished? I'm now in one of the tributes, the gallery over the north aisle. And here we find something rather surprising. There are Flying buttresses, the oldest in England. A vault exerts two kinds of pressure. Downwards, counteracted here by excessively massive piers, and outwards, counteracted by buttresses. Most people don't realize that this cathedral has flying buttresses because they are inside hidden under the aisle roofs.
To achieve greater flexibility, the Durham Vault also has some pointed arches. Nearly half a century before the arrival of the Gothic style, with which this form of arch is usually associated. In this respect, therefore, Durham led the way. Yet, with its slow, solemn rhythms, the spirit of this building is still wholly Romanesque. On the north door is the bronze sanctuary knocker a superb piece of stylization. Originally, the eye sockets are filled with colored enamel, but the disappearance of this is, in my opinion, a positive advantage. Instead, we have dark cavernous shadows, which are immensely evocative. But this is a facsimile. The original has been removed to the treasury for safekeeping. The commanding features of the exterior are the towers, which are all immensely massive. None was carried up until the Gothic period, but the west towers were completed quite early, probably by about 1220. They show that aggregation of small effects. Four tiers of comparatively small arches, some blind, some pierced, which is characteristic of Norman and early Gothic enrichment. Nonetheless, they make a very fine pair. From the 14th century until the middle of the 17th century, they carried lead-covered spires. I'm glad they don't anymore. The present crowns date only from 1801, but visually are very satisfactory. The central tower is a late 15th century replacement after the old one in 1429 had been struck by lightning and burnt. Aesthetically, it has one serious defect. The top stage was clearly an afterthought. Just below the top belfry windows is a rich parapet, which was evidently intended to be the crown of the 1465 tower. The top stage, added in the 1480s, is also too short. Nevertheless, it's a most majestic tower, and visually the decision to go higher to 218 feet was undoubtedly right. The building needs the higher central tower, as surely as it does not need spires. The exterior, for all its majesty, doesn't quite measure up to the interior. Partly, no doubt, this feeling is induced by the state of the stonework. The old building, needless to say, had no downpipes, and in the course of time, the sandstone became, in places, seriously eroded. So, in 1777, on the advice of John Wooler, a local architect, instead of replacing decayed blocks with new ones, as would be done today, they started chiseling away the entire surface to a depth of one inch, two inches, in places even over three inches. This, aided by subsequent weathering, explains the somewhat rugged and tidy character of much of the stonework today, which is now a long way from being smooth ashlar. On the south side of the cathedral is what is known as the college. This is not a building, but a precinct, and is smaller and more secluded than many a cathedral close. The buildings are all the property of the Dean and Chapter. They're of no special architectural interest, but quite delightful in their way. And these houses, together with a charming space of open lawn and informally planted trees, 
form a gracious space in the shadow of this architectural giant. Except when a waterfall of youngsters gushes forth from the chorus's school in the far corner, this is a haven of peace, one of the most electable spots in Durham. The other major occupant of the peninsula is, of course, the castle, which now belongs to that important component of the city, Durham University. The university was founded in 1833. Four years later, the ecclesiastical commissioners, at the suggestion of the dean and with the full support of the bishop, handed over Durham Castle as a college for the students. The keep by this time was ruinous, and two years later it was entirely rebuilt by Salvin. This now accommodates some of the students. But there is, and always was, a great deal else. Much is later, or has been altered, or both, but on entering through the originally 12th century gatehouse, we realize at once how grand this Norman castle was. And the reason isn't far to seek. The Bishop of Durham was for centuries the most powerful man in the north of England, a terrific grandee. He was not merely a great ecclesiastic, he was the monarch's representative in the north, empowered to keep the Scots or any other potential invaders at bay. He had his own troops, he had his own courts of law, he even had his own parliament. For centuries, Durham didn't send members of parliament to Westminster. He minted his own coinage, and until the 1560s, he had absolute control over the town. So the scale of his great hall, almost equal to the largest at Oxford and Cambridge, comes as no surprise. In the angle between the two ranges, Bishop Cousin in 1662, inserted the Black Staircase, one of the biggest in an age which was very fond of these large, sumptuous staircases. The Tuscan columns, inserted a good deal later for structural purposes, are rather a pity. The fine features are the scale and the richness of the carving. Some newel posts still carry their original vase-like ornaments with knobbed lids, to my eye inspired by artichokes. But the oldest part of the castle is the Norman chapel. One of the very few in this country to have survived virtually intact from the 11th century. The date is around 1080. Like the churches of the Anglo-Saxons, it's very tall for its area. The crude groined vaults, borne upon massive circular piers, are crowned by carved capitals of a lively but very primitive character. The prominent and attractive water markings, which you can also see in the south choir aisle of the cathedral, are due to the presence of iron oxide acting as a staining agent when the stone was formed. Palace Green 
The great lawn which separates the castle from the cathedral was never the close. Today, all the buildings by which it is bounded are occupied by the university. Several are associated with Bishop Cousin, who was one of the most famous incumbents of the sea. Here is the big early 18th century house known as Bishop Cousin's Hall. The bishop had in fact nothing to do with it, for it postdates him by several decades. It's so called because a university hall of that name occupied the house in the middle years of the last century. This looks rather splendid from a distance. Close to, we realize that the bricks aren't really very nice. And the lintels and aprons are faced with cement. The doorway, too, not in the center even of its own bay, is really slightly ridiculous. This is 18th century building at its most provincial, remote from the work of the established architects. This little building started life as the bishop's coach house and stables. Salvin built it when he was refurbishing the keep in 1841. Today, with its good lamp, it's a public laboratory. And few loos surely can hold their heads so high. The rock contains one continuous street and one only, known as the North and South Bailey. Some houses are pleasing, but few are of high architectural quality. And all can look somewhat bleak when the light is unkind. At the far end of South Bailey, the street is still cobbled, as no doubt it all used to be. Here is a house, crowned with a great flourish by an enormous shell hood, dating from, when would you say? Answer, 1910. And come to think of it, some of the hats being worn by the ladies about that time were rather like this. Round the rim of this little plateau, extending for nearly a mile in all, ran, and in some places still runs, a bracelet of ramparts, pierced by a number of posterns or gateways. and then there are the bridges. Prebens is the gem. It was built in the 1770s of the local sandstone, which Ashlar's well. Notice little subtleties, like the piercing of the parapet over the summit of each arch. Elvid Bridge and Framwell Gate Bridge both date from the 12th century. 
both have been rebuilt after floods and in the cause of widening, but the work has been well done. <laughs> Kingsgate Bridge is very different. This is a high-level footbridge built in 1963 to link the new parts of the university with the older buildings on the rock. Designed by Arab, this bridge is constantly commended, and as a work of engineering and convenience, it's no doubt very successful. As a work of art, it has, one may feel, been decidedly overpraised. The triangles which support it are not harmonious, and unfortunately, having been constructed of concrete, it's already, after only 21 years, looking drab. Until 1975, all Durham's east-west traffic had to cross Elvet Bridge, climb steeply up to the marketplace, then drop precipitously down Silver Street, equally narrow, to Framwell Gate Bridge on the west side. Then a new road was opened across the neck of the peninsula in a cutting. This was a brilliant piece of planning which enabled the old steep streets to become pedestrianised. The idea emanated as early as 1945 from Thomas Sharp, an outstanding planner. He wanted a northern bypass too, which has never been built. But I know few towns that have solved their traffic problems as successfully as Durham. However, some bad things have been done in recent years too of which the worst is the erection of a horrible lump of a building to house the National Savings Bank. The view from Framwell Gate Bridge looking north is in painful contrast to that looking south. But even looking north, I'd like to put in a good word for the Milburn Gate Shopping Centre, a modern building which fills an important site with tact and ingenuity. Every new building here has to be most carefully considered for its sighting. Nothing must intrude upon the great views. And what of the future of the cathedral? Well, the work of restoration goes on. As at cathedrals, it always must. Here it is, and for several years more will be, the east end which is in scaffolding. For the replacements, they have now to use Dunhouse sandstone brought from near Barnard Castle. It's a good stone. There are plenty of reserves in the quarries, but inevitably, at first, the new work does look a bit raw. I feel no urge to try to sum up Durham, still less this series as a whole. In all these programmes, my principal concerns have been two. First, to do what I can, and I'm well aware that it may not be very much, to help and encourage people to care. And then, to help you all to enjoy, even if only by drawing your attention to delights of which perhaps you may not previously have been aware. For make no mistake about it, if like me you're hooked on buildings, you'll never come to the end of England.
This autumn on BBC Two, a new series of 40 Minutes. Two-year-old Michael has an incurable illness. In searching for a miracle, his parents take him to Lourdes. Our man in Shanghai looks at the first week of Britain's Consul General at this new consulate. And the lives of those much-exposed models, page three girls. And then they say, oh, what well, innocent. And then you have these pair of boobs and you try and look innocent. I go, what? You know, we are joking. John Pittman interviews couples who married in 1935, 50 years old. Well, I don't know if I've done the right thing, but <laughs> time will tell. <laughs> time will tell. Take 50 years to tell. And to start the series, in between days, the joys and trials of adolescence. Well, the answer was sodium hydroxide, right? To get sodium ethanol out and ethanol. Yeah. Something like that. A new series of 40 Minutes starts next Thursday at 9.30 on BBC Two. Now we come to part two of F. Scott Fitzgerald's...